My name is Marsha Lehman. You probably recognize me some from, from two years ago. I am a Knox County Master Gardener. We have some other Knox County Master Gardeners in the audience. But our topic today is what I call prudent pruning. The focus will be on the things that should be pruned now while they're dormant. We want to focus on d being smart in our pruning. It's one thing to go out with the hedge trimmers and shoop, right, give it a shave and say we pruned. That's not prudent pruning. So let's start. The first question you ask yourself is why am I pruning? I mean, do you even have to prune? So it's getting warm, it's getting nice, but I almost, I almost never, I can't say always, but I rarely go to the garden without these hooked on my pocket. They're just part of me. Because much of cleaning up the four D's is just a little snip here, there, and elsewhere. If it's a little bigger, I brought short-handled pruners this morning just because they were easier to carry. But the four D's, dead, disease, damaged, or dysfunctional. Dysfunctional is that thing that's going to whack you in your face every time you're mowing the lawn. If that's the case, you know, don't get hurt, don't poke out your eye, prune it. That's the dysfunctional. Dead is pretty obvious. I mean, even this time of year when things haven't leafed out, the dead wood just has a different color to it. And a lot of times you can just walk up, we are talking about Japanese maples, you can just walk up and tap on them and they'll just snap right off. You don't even need a pruner. So you just go in with your, your hands and you kind of brush around the little, little stems and you'll start to notice that they are a slightly different color. So if you brush on them and they don't break, it's still got some life in it. The diseased could be insect disease, fungal disease. I mean, if you go out and you look at your crepe myrtles and they are black, then you probably had the crepe myrtle bark scale last fall and it went unattended and now this is the remnants of that. And damaged can be storm damage. It can be mechanical damage from a weed whacker, string trimmer. Those things can be taken off any time of year and should be taken off as soon as you see them. And my last comment on this is when you're walking around, don't forget to look up. Because you may find just above head level something is broken off or damaged. But another reason to prune is size control. And I kind of stuck in here, stay ahead of KUB, because we've all read about the subdivisions that have the feuds with KUB when they come in and they top. Well, that pruning mistake happened when that tree or shrub went in the ground initially. It was too big of a specimen to be planted near a power line. So now what is KUB supposed to do? Because if there's a power outage before, because of that, we're not going to go get mad with the homeowner who planted it or the homeowner who lives there now who didn't plant it but it came with the property. We get mad at KUB. Well, it's not completely their fault. So we're pruning to control growth. More often, we want to prune for shape, OK? If we're always try fighting the growth, then we probably got too big of a specimen to start with. If it bears fruit or has flowers, then we want to focus on getting airflow and sunshine into the middle of that shrub to optimize the flowering and the fruit. And that's the line below, airflow and sunlight. You need to be able to step back and say, when this thing is fully leafed out later this summer, will there still be good airflow through the middle and will sunlight be able to get down into the middle? With crepe myrtles, this is a big deal. And then this is related to the dysfunctional, the convenience of walking on your sidewalk. The number of folks who now have the safety features on their car and you have a tree branch that sticks out over the driveway and the car sensor senses it and says, whoops, I'm not going to let you run over that. You better do some pruning. OK, but before you start, you need to know what you have. And if you don't know, snap a couple pictures, call in to the Master Gardeners at 865-215-2340. They'll probably say, send me a couple of those pictures. And they'll try and help you identify what that is. 
But if you don't know what you have, then how do you know when you should prune it, how you should prune it, or even if it needs to be pruned? Confirm the recommended pruning season. In the handout, I referenced a, a fantastic UT publication, uh, publication 1619. It's about 16 pages long, but it gives a summary of, of shrubs and flowering trees, which get pruned, when they get pruned, do they need a, a heavy pruning, do they need a light pruning, can they be pruned every couple of years. It's just a really good synopsis of pruning practices for the typical homeowner landscape, and then a great plant list. If your plant isn't on there, then turn around and call, ask a master gardener and get some help. If you're going to do your own search on Google or whatever search engine you use these days, if you just say how to prune crepe myrtle, you are going to get thousands of responses and they may be from Pinterest or they may be from Joe the gardener here or you know Sally Gardner over here. If you simply add the word extension, how to prune crepe myrtle extension, then what comes to the top of your list are extension service publications. And they might be UT, but you, they might be Clemson, they might be Florida. It's not going to be Maine because crepe myrtles don't grow that far north, right? So if you add the word extension, then you get extension service publications and you can trust those. Another option is to add the .edu, because those all come from universities, are also typically research-based, may in fact overlap with the extension service. And then my third option, if you've got some really rare species that extension service has never written about, try some of the botan add botanical garden. And if you get the likes of, say, Missouri Botanical Garden, some are better than others, but that would be my third option. And then if you're still striking out, Call the master gardeners. We'll help you figure it out. So keep a record. This comes in really handy. Um, how many of you have been watching any of the pruning videos that we shot during COVID? OK. We now have about 30 pruning videos out on YouTube. And I showed you how to get to it. You go to YouTube, search Knox County Master Gardener. Each video is on a single specimen. So last year, when I was new at shooting video, I said, well, I've got this elderberry that needs to be pruned. Who in the world cares about elderberries besides me? This will be my test video. I shot that video on January 6th. I had some technical issues, but we still posted it. And it got 400 views. So there's people out there interested in elderberries besides me. So this year, I say, I'm going to redo the elderberry video. I shot it on February 1. Now, why was that the case? Well, because last fall and all of December was really warm. At Christmas time, my elderberries still had leaves on them. January 1, New Year's Day was 77 degrees, new record high, right? And then the next day it got cold and January was a cold month. The elderberry finally dropped its leaves and went dormant. So the difference between pruning January 6th in 2021 and February 1 in 2022 was totally because of weather. Those notes are in the record that I keep. You will find them immensely helpful if you start to make those kind of notes. So what else do you want to record? Make a list of what you have. And the first thing you want to note is, do they need to be pruned or don't they need to be pruned? I mean, if you've got an oak tree growing or a maple tree growing, you probably don't need much pruning. But if you've got a crepe myrtle that just went in the ground and is now two or three years old, you probably have a little structural shaping pruning to do. Not murder, but some shaping pruning. When you research some of these, make a note of does it get a light pruning or a heavy pruning? If it's something like a butterfly bush, where the recommended pruning is every year, cut it down to 12 inches. We shot one of those last year. I don't have butterfly bush, but that's what every extension service pub said to do. Another master gardener had some. I go to her house and she's like, 
let's shoot this video. So we take it off at 12 inches. Her comment was it hadn't bloomed well the last couple of years. We cut it back to 12 inches. It bloomed beautifully last year. So she's happy. I'm happy. I'm relieved. But note if, it's, if it gets heavy pruning, but butterfly bush is a bit of an exception. There aren't too many others you do that until you're ready to actually renew them. Yes? Okay, would you prune it in the spring or the winter was the question. You would prune it now while it's dormant. Yeah. The general rule of thumb is if it blooms in the spring, and I like to use forsythia, which is currently in bloom. If it blooms in the spring, you prune it as soon as it stops flowering. If it blooms in the summer, which here we generally say July 1 and later, then we prune it while it's dormant. And my sentinel plant to track on that is the crepe myrtle. We prune that now while it's dormant. It comes out of dormancy, it makes new growth, and the blooms are on the new growth. But the forsythia, the reason you have to prune it after it finishes flowering is because about six to eight weeks after it finishes flowering, it starts to put out buds this year that will flower next year. So if you don't prune your forsythia until August or September, you're cutting off a lot of next year's flowers. That's when people talk about old wood, new wood. Old wood is last year's wood. New wood is this year's wood, okay? And we have a video on that. <laughs> um, and yeah, so you just led me right into that point. And record the, the recommended time. There are some things that are sensitive. I also have figs. They get pruned while dormant, but I wait. I make a note on my calendar that starts to pop up March 1, watch the weather forecast, because if I pruned my figs, say, early March this year, like March 5th, another beautiful Saturday, 70 degrees, would have been a great day to go prune figs. Then we get the following weekend where it's 15 degrees. The figs, when they start to put out new growth that's really tender, it'll get frostbitten, and then I have to do a cleanup pruning. So I watch the figs all through March, and I'm watching the weather forecast, and when it looks like we're past having any more sub-freezing temps, then I actually get around to pruning the figs. So that varies a lot. It's usually in March, but it can vary between early March and late March. So we talked about old wood and new wood. And then there are some plants that you actually prune while they're growing. Who has formal hedges? Okay, nobody. So we don't need to spend any time on that. But that's one of the few things that you prune several times a year while it's actively growing. March to August, but stop by Labor Day. And the significance of Labor Day, right, September 7th roughly, is any new growth that comes following a pruning. Remember, pruning triggers growth. So any new growth that comes after you prune needs six to eight weeks to harden off to make it through winter. So if you take Labor Day and you add eight weeks, you're into early November, and by then we usually have some cold weather. So that's why we say you should be done pruning, except for the four Ds, by Labor Day. Okay? What do you want to write down? You want to know the basic form of the plant, and we're going to spend a little bit of time on this, but here I, here's a summary. Is this a cane shrub? So forsythias are cane shrubs. Right? They have multiple stems coming out of the ground. Blueberries are a cane shrub. Uh, Nandina is a cane shrub, and that's one that I see people take hedge trimmers to to shape. No, wrong thing to do. I'll show you what to do with cane shrubs in a moment. The elderberry, blueberry, raspberries, all those brambles, uh, red twig dogwood, those are cane shrubs. And I've gotten to the point that I like pruning cane shrubs. But it means you've got to get down on your knees because you're going to be working at ground level most of the time. But I find them to be some of the easiest things to prune. Then there are plants that have kind of a mounding habit. And those include some of the hydrangeas. Not all of them. There's a gazillion. Well, there's six major varieties of hydrangeas. Abelia, juniper, holly, lavender, snowberry. Then we get shrubs that are more like trees, and this is where the crepe myrtles come in, maybe the star of magnolia, rhododendron, rhododendron and the like. 
And then the few plants that are used as a hedge, we're not going to go there today because you don't have those. Okay, so we want to prune according to their form. So for those cane growing shrubs, you, the first thing you do is take out the four Ds dead, disease, damaged, or dysfunctional. And those cane shrubs, like forsythia, like to spray. That's their natural form. Don't expect them to stand up straight like a, a line of soldiers. I see people plant forsythias and try to make it hedge, and they prune it, trying to make it to stand up straight. That's not its natural form, and when you prune them to look like a line of soldiers, it does not look natural. I would say it doesn't look good. <laughs> um, but take out the four Ds first. Then, this is why you're down on the ground. You look at all the canes that you've got, because they keep putting up new canes. And every year, you go in and you take out the oldest. Now, which ones are the oldest? They're the biggest. So if you've got a forsythia bush that has a cane that's this big around on it, that's pretty old. Get that out of there. And when you take that off at the ground, you're taking out all that growth that came with it. Right? So one cut at the ground as opposed to, oh gee, let me shorten this, shorten this, shorten. Oh yeah, I'm gonna take it off, I'm gonna take it out completely. Make one cut instead of six. But take that stem completely as close to the ground as you can get it. And if you've inherited one where it's gotten overgrown and you've got a bunch of big ones, you probably also have a bunch of little ones all around it. And so it can be a challenge to get in there and make those cuts. The point is, if you were to go buy a forsythia, plant it, you're going to let it get established, you're going to let it grow some canes, but once they start to get more than an inch or an inch and a half in diameter, now you're going to start taking out a couple every year and keep it looking like it's five or six years old. Any cane that's older than six years is going to start to get big and be more susceptible to damage and disease and the like. So just keep it looking like a five or six year old shrub. That's the same thing you would do with blueberries. You take out a couple of the oldest canes every year, keep it looking like a five or six year old plant, because five or six years is the peak production stage for blueberries. If it needs renovation, okay, so you buy a house, it's got this, who knows how old forsythia in it, what do you do? You take and you cut that off at about six inches above the ground, and the older canes will die back. I mean, that's really hard on them. The, the younger canes, you won't have any flowers that year, that first year, but the younger canes will start to grow, and a year later, I mean, I've watched forsythia grow five or six feet in a year. Oh, yeah. And then they don't get a whole lot longer. Six feet is kind of where they top out, but they can grow that five or six feet in a single year. So if you've bought a property and it's got some forsythia, don't try and yank them out, just this is one time where you might want a chainsaw and cut them off about six inches above the ground and let them come back and as they come back, do your selective pruning. Never take hedge trimmers to a cane shrub. That is cardinal sin number one on a cane shrub. So when I see people take their hedge trimmers to Nandina, which is probably the, the one I see most often, what happens is it's a miniature version of crepe murder. You get all this new growth from where they, where they clipped it, right? So you get the, whereas a, it's a cane shrub, you really need to wear long sleeves, reach down in and start taking out the older woodier canes. Because what you'll find on a Nandina, which is here on the bottom left, is a lot of the foliage is out towards the ends if it hasn't been maintained. It's because no sunlight can get into the middle. So you start reaching down in, and most of your nandinas can be pruned with this. But you've got to kind of pull the shrub apart and reach down in and start taking out canes at the ground, thin it out for airflow and sunshine. So never, 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 please, never take a hedge trimmer to a cane shrub. Yes, another question. Okay, I will ask you to hold your crepe myrtle question just a little bit longer. Uh, but so far we have shot three videos on crepe myrtle. 
And the most recent one was just this past Saturday where we did some renovation pruning on crepe myrtles that had been murdered, I don't know, five or six years ago. They had been, yeah, you'll, you'll recognize crepe myrtle when you see it here. It's coming up. You, I can't do a pruning talk and not address crepe murder. Okay. Um, the mounding ones. This includes the hydrangea arborescence, which has things like the Annabelle, Invincible. There's, I, I don't know all the varieties, but the tag will tell you if it's hydrangea arborescence or not. Those. She doesn't know what it is. That's my sister. There's a picture of one in bloom. Yeah. Yeah. But at this time of year, it's dormant. So she can still trip. Yep. You cut it to the ground while dormant. You're down one to two inches. If it's an arborescence. Yep. I don't know if she even knows the name of that one. Okay. So we also have three videos on hydrangeas. One on arborescence. One on the paniculata, which includes limelight, because it gets pruned differently. And then one on oak leaf, which is <coughs> another really common. It's not oak leaf, it's not limelight. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Look up the videos. Yep. Um, so, you know, you can own a hedge trimmer. It's great for trimming back ornamental grasses, but don't use it on a cane shrub and don't use it on a mounding shrub. Now, azaleas are also a mounding plant, but they do not get pruned while dormant. They get pruned, they're a spring bloomer, so they get pruned after they flower, but don't ever take hedge trimmers to those either. With a mounding plant like this, again, people say, well, it's getting too big. Well, then find, find those branches that are sticking out too far and reach into the plant and take it off at a major fork or take it off all the way back at the trunk. Again, wear long pants and long sleeves because you'll be crawling around inside the plant. We've got some azaleas that the trunk is like this and it's, the green is up here and the rest is... Kind of brown because it's not getting any sunlight in the middle. Yeah, so you would want to come in again and open up, take off, you've got too many branches in there. So, no, there's no branches here. There's no, uh, there. yeah. time, to time to do some major renovation or, or maybe, as, as we joke, that may be the one cut prune, ground level. <laughs> yeah. But grab the long branches and kind of follow where they are. If there's a nice branch halfway back into the shrub, you know, clip it back there. But if you truly have altogether too many branches in there and no airflow or sunlight, take it off all the way back at the trunk. So that's a selective thinning, and the goal is to get airflow and sunlight in there so that you do get some vegetation and you do get some more flowers. But they are a mounding plant. Then we have the tree-like things. This is where the crepe myrtle comes in. This is what a crepe myrtle should look like. <laughs> we have somebody in the back just making faces at me. I'm sorry. Um, you're not the only one who reacts that way. But you'll notice there's, it's a multi-stemmed, which tends to make it a shrub as opposed to a tree. It's a multi-stemmed plant. And I really, aside from the fence here, that's really the only gauge I have for how high up they have cleared. So when you're pruning a crepe myrtle, and you prune them while they're dormant, so you can see the entire structure. There's no leaves on them. They get pruned now. You start at the bottom, you take off all the suckers, because crepe myrtles are inclined to sucker. And you can take suckers off any time of year, but boy, this time of year, get rid of them. Then you strip off all the branches up to about shoulder height. And then you never do this on the left. You never top it like that. Now, this is what we see, and I see homeowners do it, and um, some of you who have come to talks in the past heard me talk about my little Taiwanese neighbor lady for whom I did all her lawn and garden work. There was a beautiful red crepe myrtle in front of her house. 
she sold the house and moved in the fall of 2018. The young couple moved in. They didn't touch it until about six weeks ago when they hired somebody to come in and top it at about nine feet. It had been 20 feet tall. It was gorgeous, and I just wanted to cry. Um, yeah, so on a crepe myrtle, go after the four Ds, remove all the suckers, never top it. That's what we call crepe murder. It doesn't kill the tree. It does stress it. But the fact that the crepe myrtles don't die is a testament to how hardy they are, that they can take that type of abuse. So then you want to selectively prune back to a side branch or a main stem. So here, not only does it have a mulch volcano around it, that's bad, but there's too many main stems coming out of there. You know, landscapers or landscape designers would tell you you need an odd number, and their preference is three or five. That one's got who knows how many. And then when you top it like that, what happens? You, you come up and you chop it. Now you get eight or ten spindly sprouts that pop up after the pruning. Now where does it bloom? It blooms on new wood. How big are those blooms? How heavy are those blooms? So you've got these eight or ten spindly little sprouts coming out of this knuckle where it got murdered. It gets a heavy bloom on it, which is going to pull it down, and sometimes will break it. It does not look natural to see, you know, this great big stem coming up and now these eight or ten water sprouts, effectively. Um, the video that we shot Saturday, we had a row of seven, not at a homeowner, but at a, another facility. Um, it had probably been four or five years since they had been murdered, and then they had been neglected since then. So we found knuckles where you could see that maybe three or four spindly little things had broken off from a heavy bloom. There was just this little half inch, half inch long and quarter inch diameter, you could see where it had broken off. But most of those knuckles still had like five coming off of them. And we would take the three smallest and leave the two biggest, unless of course they were growing back in towards the center or crossing. But in most cases, if there were five, we took three out and we kept the two biggest ones. Yeah, I would highly recommend the, that. That's the first renovation pruning video we did. That is often the case. And what I would say is, if you inherited one of those, um, we did not go up real high in these specimens. I had a two-step step stool. That was as high as I went, and I'm a short person. Um, but if you inherit a property like that, this is the time of year to go out and reduce how many of the shoots are coming out of those knuckles. Keep the biggest ones that are growing kind of in the form of the tree um, and prune off the others. And in a year or two, you'll, you won't have to do that anymore. Okay. Then we have hedges. And I know nobody here has hedges, but this is where you are going to get two or three minutes about hedges. Sunshine and airflow means we need to keep the base wider than the top. If you take them straight up and down, sunshine doesn't get into the base, and that's where you see what was supposed to be a row of hedges, and all you see are the basic stems or trunks at the bottom, and then the green starts. But if you shape it this way, you can keep the green growing all the way down to the ground level. So this is right. This is definitely incorrect, where the base is narrower, because the top is creating shade on the bottom. These I like to call meatballs. But they have the same problem, because they curve in on the bottom. So you can put it in the ground, and it's green when you plant it. But in a couple of years, the bottom is all going to be bare wood, because the foliage isn't getting any sunshine. So the better way is to make it a mound. And then in the mound, it is wider at the base than at the top. Extremely common 
in home landscapes. We don't want meatballs. This nice hedge here on the left was done correctly. It is wider at the base. And these are the things that need the hedge trimmers, the only thing that need the hedge trimmers. But even on these, periodically, like every three years or so, you do need to put on your long gloves or your long sleeves and start reaching inside. And what you'll find is inside is mostly brown wood with no leaves because all the foliage on the outside is shading it. Yeah, it's nice and green on the outside, but when you pull it apart and look inside, there's not a whole lot of green. So every couple of years, you should go in and do some selective thinning. Yep. My solution is I don't grow hedges. <laughs> I don't either. That's too much work. I mean, to keep them looking pretty, they, they need to be sheared probably once a month. Well, because pruning triggers growth. So, you know, I can come in here and prune this, and maybe six feet down, here's this little branch that said, oh, I just got pruned. Boom! So now you've got this one that sticks out. Are you going to let it there? No, you're going to go out and you're going to snip it off. Or you're going to hire somebody to snip it off. I still like to do my own work. Okay, so the basic techniques here are always get rid of the four Ds. Dead disease, damaged, dysfunctional. Know what it should look like. That, I'll come back to the, to the forsythia. The forsythia is a plant that is a cane shrub and it likes to spray. If you don't like that look, then don't plant a forsythia. Know that that's what it should look like. And don't ask it to be something it's not. I mean, I love the blooms on a crepe myrtle, but I don't have any crepe myrtle because I think they're kind of dirty. They're pretty when they bloom, and then all those blossoms turn to seed pods, and if, you're, if it's near a sidewalk or a driveway, now you have all the equivalent of little marbles all over your driveway and sidewalk, and I don't want to be bothered going out to clean that up. They are kind of dirty in that sense. Don't ask it to be clean. It's not in its nature. General rule of thumb is I start at the bottom. And that comes from all the cane shrubs that I've done. Start at the bottom and work my way up. But I even attack crepe myrtles the same way. Take off the suckers, clear off any branches that are coming out up to about four feet high. Thin out the middle as necessary, thinking about airflow and sunshine. And then if you've got, my Nandinas happen to be the compact variety, but if you see the larger varieties, the ones that get berries, they often will send out this great big long shoot. Yeah, I call it a moonshot. Get rid of those. I mean, it, it, it will continue. Don't just cut it back. Don't just cut it back. Follow that one all the way to the ground and take it out. Um, make proper cuts. Use the right tools. And as I say, most of your, if you, if you're, if you are planting, you might do a light pruning when the plant goes in the ground because maybe you just have one cane too many or maybe it got damaged transporting it home from the nursery. You know, if there's any damage from that, get rid of that right away. Um, if it's bigger than, say, half an inch, then you move up to your loppers. And I brought short ones today just because they were easier to carry. And if it's bigger than what the loppers can handle, which is roughly about an inch, maybe an inch and a quarter, then I move up to um, a folding saw. And if you need something bigger, then you probably need an arborist. I mean, there are some folks who will use chainsaws. I'm not one of them. I mean, I oh man. Okay, thank you for asking about the reciprocating saw. My master gardener friends know that I like tools, so I just bought a cordless reciprocating saw to go work on these seven crepe myrtles because I knew we were going to have some bigger cuts. The key is, everybody know what a reciprocating saw is? You ever hear of a sawzall? Mil Milwaukee brand is called a sawzall, but it's, Milwaukee is a brand of tools. It's red. Uh, but, but it's about this long, and they come corded, and they come cordless these days. 
But then you put in a blade of varying lengths, but they make blades that can, they're largely used in construction. So you'll get blades that can, <clears throat> that can cut your two by fours if you're building a house. They have blades that can cut through wood and the nails that you may accidentally hit. They have blades that will cut metal and they have pruning blades, which are made specifically for pruning. They do work. I know a commercial blueberry grower who uses a reciprocating saw to do her annual pruning of 700 blueberries, right? You're not going to go out and do that, right? It's not as fast as a chainsaw. It's not as fast as a chainsaw, but I do think it's safer. And I would tell you that when I bought the blades to use on this crepe myrtle series we just did Saturday, I bought a six inch blade intentionally. They also made a nine inch pruning blade, but my concern was since we were going to be taking out some center stems, I was concerned that I would accidentally nick an adjacent stem, so I intentionally bought a six inch pruning blade. But the key is, you know, you've got to get the face plate of that reciprocating saw up against what you're cutting. Otherwise, it will chatter your teeth and vibrate your glasses off your face. Yeah, the way that it works. But it, it is a good tool, and I would use that before I would use a chainsaw. But I would also say I have never used it at home. I used it on this other property that had the seven, the line of seven crepe myrtles. And... I'm pleased to say I had four other women helping me and we got them pruned in 90 minutes, shot the video at the same time, and then it took us about 30 minutes to clean up all the debris and load it on a trailer to go to the green waste facility. Um, a general rule of thumb is not to take off more than about a third of the plant because that will stress it. There are some exceptions. Things like Japanese maples, which grow so slowly, have a much lower. You don't want to take off more than 10 to 15% of a Japanese maple at any one time. But for most of our shrubs, a quarter to a third. So when you, when you look at the cane shrubs, you know, elderberry, forsythia, I'm just taking out the biggest, oldest ones. I don't really worry about the one-third to one-quarter. I just go in and say, which are the biggest, fattest ones you're coming out this year? On, uh, on the crepe myrtles that we were working on, you kind of say, well, if I cut it all down and put it in a pile, how big would that pile be? Okay, I want my pile to not be more than a quarter to a third that size with what I actually take off. What about blueberries? Are they canes? They are indeed canes. And here the question was, what about blueberries? With a lot of the cane things, there are general recommendations of how many canes you should have. Blueberries have one of the highest numbers. You, you can have 12 to 15 canes. You want to get rid of the really, really spindly ones. I say anything smaller than the diameter of a number two pencil. They, yeah, yeah because if it's, if it's really spindly, it's not going to grow very well. Yeah, we inherited these. Yep, that's okay. Yeah, so you're going you're gonna to have a serious pruning to get down to 12 or 15. So you're going to take out the really spindly ones, and you're going to take out some of the biggest, fattest ones. Uh, other things, you know, like roses, um, you want three to five main stems. I watch people just let their roses get so overgrown, and they come out and they shear them. No. <laughs> Carolyn will tell you, yeah, don't do that. Carolyn has a... Gr Carolyn is featured in our rose pruning shrub video. Yes, you did a great job, Carolyn. Okay, when we talk about proper cuts, the first thing you want to do is look at the branch and how are the side branches coming off? Do they come off kind of what's called alternating where one is here, the next one is here, and then the next one is here. They alternate from one side to the other as opposed to I was looking around, what's a good example of one that is opposite, where they truly come off directly opposite each other? Turns out the elderberries. When you look at an elderberry cane, the side branches all come off directly opposite each other. And it makes it harder to get in there and make a good clean cut. But for those that are alternate, 
branches, <clears throat> the first three pictures, the first one is the right way to do it. You want about a 45 degree angle cut. And that's to keep water from collecting on top. If water hits it, you want it to shed. The second one is angled way too much, so now you're making a great big wound. It'll shed water, but it's a gigantic wound. The third one is too low. And it's low compared to where that little side bud is up here. This one is obviously too high. So what happens when we make too high a cut? There's trees and shrubs have this ability to compartmentalize decay. So when you make a proper cut, the tissue around it will heal over given time. But if you make too high a cut, it can't really close over because between that bud and the end is nothing doing photosynthesis. So it will effectively die back to that bud. So for instance, in these crepe myrtles we pruned on Saturday, when I went to inspect them, I noticed that someone had tried to take a couple of the main stems out, but they cut them at 12 or 15 inches above the ground. That may have been the best cut they could have made at the time. I don't think so. It was just not really knowing what they were doing, except I got to get something out of here. But in the years that it had then been neglected, I reached down to one of these 12 or 15 inch high stubs, just leaned on it, and it broke right off at the ground. I mean, it stopped doing photosynthesis. It couldn't compartmentalize the decay, and it just so rotted. Oh yeah, you clean that out. Okay, yep. And on a branch, on a branch that comes off of a main trunk, you do not want to cut it flush with the trunk because you're cutting the bark of the trunk. If you look closely where the branch comes out, there's a little ridge of what looks like bark, but it's called a branch collar. And that tissue is what is able to heal the wound. So we had one where on Saturday where there was like a two or three inch dead stub coming out of the branch collar where they had attempted to cut off a limb but cut, rather than come back to the collar they had cut it out a couple inches it was completely dead so we just took the saw and cut it right at the branch collar okay so let's wrap up Always get rid of the four Ds. You can do four Ds any time of year. Anytime you're out walking your property, have your pruners on your pocket, get rid of those. General rule of thumb, I like to start at the bottom and work my way up. Along the way, especially as I get off the ground and up into the middle, I'm looking to prune for airflow and sunshine. And if you look at the video that we made on Saturday, at the very end I put a before and after picture of each of the seven shrubs. and if you only saw the after, you wouldn't recognize that they truly had been pruned unless you could see a pruning cut, you know, happened to be facing the street. But if you look at the before and after, you can say, oh yeah, there's a whole lot more airflow going to get through here than in the after picture than in the before picture. I strongly recommend keeping a journal, some, you know, you can keep it on a calendar, which is what I do. And then I start to set reminders on my digital calendar to pop up. You start watching the weather forecast. On the flowering shrubs, you need to know, does it bloom on old wood or new wood? And old wood is just last year's wood. New wood is what grows after we do the dormant pruning. Stick to the one-third rule. This group doesn't care about hedges. Neither do I. Um, use the right tools. And go watch some of our videos. So I've listed here um, the UT publication 1619, the one that has the general description of proper pruning and then has the plant list and a summary of does it need light pruning or heavy pruning? Do you prune it in the spring or in the summer? When does it flower? The essentials. Um, we've got the Knox County Extension Service as well as Ask a Master Gardener at the same phone number. And then uh, if you go out to YouTube, just search Knox County Master Gardeners and up will pop a couple of, couple of options and the video series is all within Speakers Bureau. 
And then on Facebook, if you're a Facebook user, we have a public facing page called Knox County Master Gardeners. And then there's a second group called Knoxville Area Gardening Tips, which actually, in addition to fielding questions during the week, on Facebook does a Saturday morning broadcast live on Facebook. I don't know if any of you have, have found that yet or not. 